morning and welcome to Faith Bible Baptist Church. Good to see you on a beautiful summer day. Hope you're enjoying the beautiful sunshine. As we get to our seats, let's turn to page 624. Count your blessings. There's too many to count, but we'll try. 624, when you get there, let's all stand. We'll sing all four verses. 624. standing we'll turn to page 13 next hope you have one blessing of knowing Christ as your Savior Amen. and someday we'll get to do this song Amen. page 13 crown with with many crowns crown him with many crowns
stay standing for prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for loving us while we were yet sinners. You didn't wait for us to be what you wanted us to be before you gave the greatest gift to us, and that was your life. Thank you for loving us despite of us, and Lord, thank you for putting up with us despite of us, and Lord, thank you for someday glorifying us, and Lord, we owe it all to you, and today, if you are not glorified, I pray that you convict each and every one of us. I pray that you would work on each of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that the pride that we might have because we look good, we sound good, I pray we'll throw that away, and I pray that we'll run desperately and in total dependence on you. I pray that we would crawl, we would beg, we would ask, take us out of the way. Lord, if we are the hindrance of your work being done on this place, I pray you remove that. I pray that you would get glorified. Help the preaching today. And Lord, I'm excited to hear what you have to say to the man of God. Lord, I pray that you would help the man of God. Lord, I thank you for the study has put on to the your word, and I'm excited to hear it. Lord, for the lost that may be coming in here and not knowing for certain that heaven will be their home, may you let them know that this is a place that preaches the truth, that there is a way that man can get saved, and that is in your name, in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today that they will find you as their savior, they'll be converted, and their life will be transformed as it has done it for us. Lord, I pray that we would love our religiousm, and Lord, I pray that we would take that out. I pray that we would find today a special day, and I pray that it would be not an emotion, that we would come and just doing the things we do because uh, we go to church, but I pray that it will be a day of meaning and a day of it was good that we met with you. Lord, bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay standing, 129, 129, at the cross, will I think of the words, 129, to all four verses. Amen. At the cross. We hope today that if you don't know the Lord as your Savior by faith, you can go to the cross today and uh, look and be saved. 
and trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Welcome this morning to Faith Bible Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Cole. We're glad to have you uh, with us on a beautiful summer Sunday. Glad you made it out to the house of the Lord. I uh, hope this will be the day of your salvation if you don't know the Lord. It can be. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's what 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says in the Bible. There's a day in your life when you meet the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as your Savior. It's not some progress or some religion and gradually you get to earn your way to his presence. No, you, you meet him someday as you are. And uh, you just come as a sinner and say, Lord, I need a Savior. Would you come into my life and save me? And he does. That happened to me back in November of 1969, one Sunday morning in a little Bible-believing church in a town called West Falls. Where I met Jesus Christ. I walked into that church unsaved. I walked out saved. And I've been saved ever since uh, because Jesus saves you, gives you eternal life, and keeps you eternally secure forever. And so think about that this morning, and, but don't think too much. There's not much to think about. All you got to think is, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. And you qualify. You qualify. You can be saved. So anyone need the bulletin today? We got uh, some bulletins with information about upcoming activities around in and around the church. Raise your hand. A couple articles in there to read read that we don't cover. Okay, good. Tonight we have a missionary, uh, Nathan Roberts, with us and his family back from South Africa. I'm not sure, but when we started supporting him and he went to South Africa, I don't think he had any children. Now he's coming tonight with six kids. So he uh, hasn't been here in a while. Uh, so uh, and you'll meet the family. They're going to be singing, and uh, he'll be preaching. And so let's have a good attendance tonight to support one of our supported missionaries. We support him in prayer and financially, but let's support him. I know any missionary can tell you we got uh, Sister Monique Lindsay with us today. Uh, she's a missionary going to Liberia. And I think any one of them can tell you that it's great when they go to a church to present. There's a lot of people there. It just encourages their hearts. And for these that have been serving our Lord in South Africa, it will encourage them if you will be here tonight at uh, 6 o'clock. Tomorrow through Friday is teen camp in Butler, Pennsylvania. And so I don't think it's too late for any teens to get in on that and uh, go for the week of camp. And let's be praying for them all week. Tuesday, the Dunkirk Fair starts. We have a tent on the main thoroughfare coming in from the main gate where we talk to people about the Lord and uh, pass out gospel tracts, literature, that type of thing that begins Tuesday and it goes all the way through next Sunday. So that's six days from noon we open and we go till 10 o'clock, used to go to 11, but uh, Pastor Burke uh, stopping it at 10. So we divide that time evenly with two and a half hour shifts from noon till 2.30, 2.30 to 5, 5 to, uh, uh, 5 to 7.30 and 7.30 to 10. 7.30 to 10 at night is only for men uh, because there's so many nutcases out there. Um, but we'd like to have at least two people in the tent at all time. It's not our tent, it's Victory Baptist Church. We turned it over to them. But uh, because of COVID, it's been three years, so we're probably a little rusty at this. But there is uh, clipboards over there, and anywhere there's a red X on that clipboard, we need somebody. We'd like to have at least two people in the tent all, at all times. People from Victory will be coming. We think some people from Hilltop and uh, maybe from Countryside. We may get a few helpers, but we need a lot of help. And the main thing we need right now is someone to help Ty Warden move the stuff out to the tent from the church here in Eden. Banners, tables, tracks, all that kind of stuff, chairs. Uh, he wants to meet with somebody at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning here. And he can take his pickup truck, help load up, and we'll try to get all the stuff out tonight after church. 
and I can show you what we mean. But then go to Dunkirk, help set it up, make a nice display. And so, uh, I may ask here in a few minutes who can do that. One or two people, if you happen to have the day off tomorrow, that would really help uh, Tyler get it all set up uh, Monday, get ready. But let's be praying now every day that God will bring prepared hearts to that tent. You know, one day your heart was prepared, I hope, and one day mine was. So when I heard the gospel, I said, I want that. I want to be saved. And there are people who are going to be walking by our tent who are at that point right now. Others were just going to be able to sow the seed of the Word of God in their hearts, and maybe years later they'll be ready, but who knows? So we need you to sign up, and then next to the sign-up clipboards is the, uh, the rules you have to read and agree to if you go out there, um, and then you got to sign that, so please. Uh, we need to do that this, today and uh, tonight. Wednesday, we're back for our midweek service. Starts at 6.30, whenever you can get here. And the books of the Bible. Do you know the Old Testament yet? We should be through the Old Testament right about now. So let's see if we can do it. Ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Those last uh, six are in your bulletin this month for July. And so some of you got that down pretty good. Way to go. All right. Also, Brother Frank Broughton is down at camp. Been there three weeks. And uh, because he hasn't been here, believe it or not, the grass needs to be mowed or in and around the, uh, the back of the church back there. So if somebody wants to see me about that, uh, let me know. We got one of those John Deere things, you know, that goes like this, and you turn around on a dime, and so it's a lot of fun. Uh, so if, if you got any time this week and you want to help with that, uh, let me know. Uh, that would be pretty neat. So, okay. Well, we're really glad to have Miss Monique with us today, going to Liberia, uh, having their send-off at her local church down in South Carolina, August 28th. And she hopes to be there in September. And she is going to be working with disadvantaged children, disabled children, deaf children, and any soul, any age. She's going to be trying to win them to the Lord in that country. So we're glad to have her. Mom's going to sing at this time, I believe. Do you have your piano player here? Here he comes. Good time. Very good timing, Kyle. Come on up. And uh, I'm going to pray. The ushers are going to come to receive the offering at this time. And we'll also pray for Doug Beltran. He's over in uh, Italy for five weeks tending to some business adventures he's involved in. And Pastor Chris is going to the Philippines Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Well, that's coming up. He's got to tend to some business over there that we pray will be successful in, like, selling their house, car, and, and those, those types of things so that won't... They won't have those attachments uh, here as he becomes our pastor next year. So uh, let us uh, pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, morning and for those that are in the house of the Lord, the children downstairs. We pray for the growth of the church that even in the summertime, people would remember you and remember the importance of fellowship. Bless the tithes and the offerings now. Help Brother Tyler. Lord, give us some that would help him tomorrow. And Make a real nice display that would be attractive, that would cause people to look in even and read the scriptures on the big banners. And, and we pray for prepared hearts to come into the tent this week. We pray for laborers, Lord. You might touch hearts of people even in this room to maybe go out for a shift or two this week and, and make themselves available to try to lead someone to Christ. Bless this message we have in song now and, and from the word of God. We pray for... Uh, Sister Monique, as she uh, is winding down her deputation, that she would have everything she needs and more 
and she would be filled with your spirit uh, as she goes to that country to help not just children, but any precious soul that she can reach. God bless her for that. Lord, I do pray for Doug. I pray for Pastor Barron as they have these uh, business adventures that they, they would have wisdom and the will of God in each and every one. Thank you for those that have been sick or are back with us this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so pray for others still not here. And bless uh, the, the teen camp this week, the Dunkirk Fair. And Lord, just in our day-by-day -day lives, help us to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen. Let's turn to the book of Acts. The basis for that song was in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22, where the prophet asked, is there no balm in Gilead? And uh, there is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and we who have sin sick souls uh, can be saved and healed. And healed, amazing what God can do in us and uh, praise the Lord for that. We don't have to be sinners and sick all of our lives. We can be saved and healthy in the Lord. So thank you, Mrs. Lindsay, for digging up that song. I haven't heard that one in decades, but uh, what a blessing uh, to hear that song. All right, you should be receiving um, some notes. Uh, make sure you get them. There should be chart one on one side, chart two on the other. And uh, we will look at them uh, shortly here. And I know that with these charts in your hand, you're going to be a little bit distracted, but I, I'd like to try to get you to pay attention now to the Word of God. Uh, the title of the message is, What If? What If? Uh, just two words, question mark. What if? 
And basically what I want to say is, what if we did what our Lord said? <laughs> what if we did what our Lord said with the gospel? And I'm going to show you what would happen if we did what, we, what, what, what the Lord said we should do with the gospel. And uh, it, it's just, you know, if you're here today and you're thinking, man, there's no hope for this world. There's no hope for America. Uh, I'm going to give you math today that's going to change your mind. I don't know if your heart will change or my heart will change. But I'm going to give you math that, and I hate to even use the word, but the genius of God in his plan for worldwide evangelism and uh, how simple it is, how profoundly simple it is, but we don't do it. And, and usually, like in, in most churches you go to, there's a, just this handful of vibrant soul winners who really are soul conscious and, and try to really reach others for the Lord and so the rest, I, I don't know, it just, it uh, just, uh, you know, I was reading about William Carey. Uh, he, uh, back in the 1700s, 1800s, he's called the father of modern day missions. He was a Baptist preacher, but when he got, I think he got saved when he was 17, he became so enthusiastic about his salvation that he just started telling everybody and he ended up going to India for 40, 41 years as a missionary there. And what an example he was. And, and probably any missionary that's going to the mission field today knows who William Carey is. If they study missiology, and, and he has probably influenced his life. He, he profoundly influenced a guy named Adoniram Judson once. He profoundly influenced a guy named Hudson Taylor once. He profoundly influenced a guy named David Livingston once, and probably thousands and thousands of other missionaries who are not as well known. Uh, William Carey, he, he was called God's plotter. He just plotted along day by day, but he enthusiastically told people. He never, he never could stop telling people what happened to him when the Lord saved his soul. And uh, we think, oh, isn't that wonderful story? It should be our story. Every one of us, it should be our story that, uh, boy, I got to share with somebody what the Lord did for me. And if we, if, we, if we could just grasp the Lord's great commission that the church has known for 2,000 years and did it, I, I'm just going to show you today mathematically in your mind, you'll even say, boy, that we could have a different country in no time. Uh, we could have a different world in no time, but we just don't do it. We just don't do it. We do what we want, don't we? And uh, we got to get our wanters fixed. In Acts 6, let's look at a little bit of the arithmetic God uses. First of all, addition. Addition. Notice God uses addition. In Acts 6 and verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied... Uh, there also, I'm sorry, this is um, Acts 2, please. That's a multiplication. Addition, first of all, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts 2, 41, you know this verse probably. Then they that were, uh, gladly received his word were baptized. This is after Peter was preaching. Mrs. Lindsay just sang about Peter preaching. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look at verse 20, uh, 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Chapter 5 and verse number 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. Notice in these verses the word added. Turn to chapter 11 and 24. Here we see the testimony of a man named Barnabas. This is a wonderful testimony. It'd be nice if we all had a testimony like this attached to our names. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. And so Barnabas was just a good man. And uh, he was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He believed, and as a result of being filled with the Spirit and believing God would use him, much people were added to the Lord because of Barnabas. So there's addition. 
And then there's multiplication, which I want to talk about more today. Acts 6, verse 1 now, where we started. In those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied. Now, some problems came up. It tells us about in verses 1 uh, down uh, through 6, and they had to fix that in the church. But it says, the church in Jerusalem multiplied, multiplied. And in verse uh, number 7, it says, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Even the priests, man, people that you didn't think would ever get saved, God saved, and by this time there's almost 8,000 people in Jerusalem who had been added to the church or as a result of multiplication, uh, been saved. Now, I've given you some charts, and uh, we're going to do some pretending here. You've got to do some pretending for these charts, because who knows, only God knows who's really saved. But uh, I, want to, I want you to pretend that the church would multiply today, that it would multiply uh, that means when you get saved, you reach somebody else. And when they get saved, the two of you reach somebody else. And when they get saved uh, and reach someone else, the four of you. Uh, and it just multiplies that way. Uh, what is the potential of that? Well, I, I checked on Google, and I checked at Christianity. Now, when you Google Christianity, you find out it's the largest religion in the world. Uh, 2.6 billion followers. Well, we know about that. Uh, maybe professors of faith in Christ, but not possessors of Christ. They've probably not been born again. And then it lists the denominations, Catholic, you know, Methodist and Presbyterian, Assemblies of God, and so on. And then you come across the word Baptists. And Google says, it was, I don't know what website I was on, but uh, on chart number one here that you have, it says there are 100 million Baptists on earth today. 100 million on Baptist, uh, Baptists on earth today. 100 million. Now, down on the right, you'll see that the approximate world population today is 8 billion. It's not quite there. I think it's more like 7.8, 7.9 billion, but we're almost up to 8 billion people on this planet at this time. And we look at that and say, how in the world could we ever possibly reach that many people? Very simply by doing things Christ's way. Jesus gave us the Great Commission uh, five times. In Matthew 28, and verses 18 through 20, uh, he said, Go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In Mark 16, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That's the second time he gave it, Mark 16. Luke 24, verses 43 through 48, and that repentance and remission of sins be preached in my name among all nations. And then John, he gave the gospel very simply. He quoted Jesus when Jesus said, as the Father hath sent me, so send I you. And then in Acts, Luke wrote it again when he wrote the book of Acts. He said, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, in the context, he wasn't talking to the 12 disciples. It would be absolutely impossible for 12 men to do that. He was giving the church the Great Commission 2,000 years ago, and the wisdom of it is found in the word multiplication. Multiplication, if every single person who ever came to know the Lord as their Savior reached one other person, the gospel would multiply. 
And so let's say, and here's where we're going to do some pretending. There's 100 million Baptists on earth today. We're going to pretend that they're saved. All right, I kind of doubt it, but we're going to pretend that they're saved. And what I know about Baptists is that usually they're gospel preaching people. Uh, try to get people saved, born again, into the family of God. They don't believe everybody's a Christian, that you're born into a Christian family or baptized into the body of Christ. You know, you need to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There needs to be a day, a moment in your life. And you might not remember the date or anything, but... But it happened one moment in your life when you realized you were a sinner, you needed a savior, you called on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that he died upon a cross at Calvary in your place and shed his blood to wash away your sins, was buried and rose again, and you came to him as a sinner saying, there is nothing I can do to save myself. Would you please save me? And you asked Jesus Christ to save you and you found his promise to be true that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you receive Christ into your heart as your Savior. Now that's what Baptists traditionally preach because that's Bible. Baptists are Biblicists. They follow the Bible. They preach the Bible. They preach the gospel. So we're going to pretend, well, if you take that 100 million and there's 8 billion people on earth, that means there's one Baptist for every 80 people on earth. Now, let's pretend we're the only ones that say, are saved. That's not true. But let's pretend just for the sake of understanding numbers, because there's a lot of other people that are saved, you know, and don't call themselves by any name. Maybe they're non-denominationalists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Assembly of God, Pentecostals, Charismatics, whatever. There's a lot of people that are saved outside of the Baptist church, for sure. But we're going to just pretend, just for the sake of understanding this. Well, so there's one Baptist here. There's 80 people over here. Well, he reaches one. Now there's two. Then they multiply, and there's four. Then they multiply, and there's eight. They multiply, there's 16. They multiply, there's 32. They multiply, there's 64. How many are there? 80. What are we up to in... Six steps of obedience, 64. Double that, 128. That's more than the whole world. Six steps of obedience. Pretty good plan. The church just has not followed it. Has not followed it. And there's always one or two or three or ten in every church who are on fire for God trying to reach souls soul conscious is what I call they go into life every day wondering who can I witness to who am I going to cross paths with today and maybe sow the seed of the word of God who's ready to meet Christ that I can lead to the Lord now the bigger numbers are here and it's the same thing in seven steps seven steps we'd be up to 12 billion people now I know we're going to hit a wall when you maybe get to Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and so on and so forth but this is Christ's plan, that we multiply, and that we reach somebody, and then the two of us reach somebody, and then there's four, and they reach somebody, and there's eight, and so on and so forth. And there it is. That, you know, you can't argue with these numbers. It's just God's plan. It's awful simple. And I think if God's people all over the world, not just in this room, I'm talking to every person in this room trying to win someone to the Lord, whether it, you, you don't even have to be on a soul winning program to do that or a bus route or anything. You just, in your life, maybe at work or in your neighborhood or somebody, and you say, God, lead me to somebody that I can lead to Christ. Eventually, you will. And uh, there's the numbers, you can't deny them, of multiplication and how the world could be reached. Did you, you understand I'm saying, I believe, you know, a lot of us do not like what we're seeing in the world right now, but I think the world could be different if the body of Christ obeyed a commission Jesus gave the church 2, 
thousand years ago. I think the world could be different in a short time. Short time. Well, look at the other side here. Let's look at evangelicals. What about America? Some people say, there's no hope for America. We're shot. Well, look at the percentages of evangelicals in the 50 states. And I want to thank Kathy Vespa for giving me this information a couple of weeks ago or whenever that was. Thank you, Kathy. This source at the bottom is the U.S. Census Bureau 2019. That was three years ago. And the Census Bureau is pretty thorough, uh, pretty accurate. And these are the 50 states and the percentage of people in those states who identify themselves as evangelicals. Now, we, we identify ourselves as Baptists or separatists or independents or especially fundamentalists. And fundamentalists, that just simply means we, we believe the fundamentals of the Word of God. We believe we should follow the Bible regarding beliefs and behavior. It's very simple. That's all a fundamentalist is, is we believe we should look into the Bible, find out what our beliefs are and what our behavior should be. That's all it means. But these are evangelicals. Evangelicals are basically people who, when interviewed, say they are a born-again Christian. They have received Christ as their Savior, and they attend evangelical churches. Whether they really are or not, who am I to, to question? I don't know. And these are the states and the rankings of evangelicals. Of course, number one, it says here, is Tennessee. Can you imagine that? 52% of the people in the census three years ago, 52% of the people in Tennessee said, I'm born again. We should thank God for some people in Tennessee who have been faithful with the gospel for a long time. They've been faithful. That's why. And it's not just the well-known Tennesseans like Lee Roberson, uh, who started over 130 church plants that are still going today. Uh, praise the Lord for his vision and Clarence Sexton and all the other wonderful people in Tennessee. That's where I'm moving soon. <laughs> but people in Tennessee have been faithful with the gospel. Now, can you imagine if the people in Tennessee all got together, every evangelical, man, woman, boy, girl, and said, you know what, let's all try to reach one more in our state. What would Tennessee be like? They'll all be converted. <laughs> now, I know we're going to run across people who are, yeah, you know, get off my property I'm not, or whatever. But do you think all the evangelicals in Tennessee are trying to win others to Christ? No. But what if they did? And that's something. Look at the top five. Kentucky, 49. Alabama, 49. Oklahoma, 47. Arkansas, 46. What if they all said by God's grace, let's all, every one of us, not just pastors, evangelists, missionaries, everyone in the pew, teenagers, children, moms, dads, everybody who's been saved, let's pray that over the next year, God will allow you to reach one more soul. Those entire states would be converted for Christ. Now, it's hard for us to believe this because we're down there at number 48. And we look at America from a New York perspective and we say, we are shot, man. This nation's gone. But that's because nine out of ten people you meet in New York State and say, oh, I haven't been born again and I'm not interested in that at all. Ten percent. But let's say New Yorkers really got with it. I mean, everybody in every evangelical church in New York State said, God help me to find somebody to reach with the gospel. The first step would be what, 20%? 10 to 20%? New York. Then everyone says, let's reach two, or let's, let's reach someone else, and then these that we just reached, let's encourage them to reach 20% to what? 
40%. Multiply, 20 plus 20, 40. 40 plus 40, 80. How many steps was that? This is God's plan. It's been his plan for several thousand years. At the bottom is the conclusion. Now, what I did was I took all 50 states, all the percentages, added them up on a calculator. Have you ever heard of one of those? <laughs> I remember when the calculator was invented. And I can remember a dad who wouldn't let us use it. He says, you figure it out on paper. You get a pen, pencil. We, all the time, I was managing his store. We never had a calculator. We'd have to, all right, that'll be, we tell him. We have to make change. We have to make change. We didn't have the thing pop up and say, give them back a dollar eighty-four. We have to make change. But anyways, I'm on a rabbit trail here. So I added all 50 up. Divided it by 50, and look at the bottom, the very bottom line on chart two. Conclusion, America is 25.04% evangelical. Now, let's say that represents saved people. Let's just say that, okay, it's saved people. What if that 25% of everybody who says they're saved in America would reach another soul for Christ? How fast could we be living in a different country? If they all reached one, there would be 50% of the country now professing to be evangelical, believers, Christians, whatever. Obedience to the Great Commission. If everyone reached one, one, our country, 50% of the country would be evangelical. What would happen after the second step? Who knows the math? Some, everybody. Two steps. Two steps, our country. But what happens? The church absolutely refuses to do it. So that's the pastor's job, that's the evangelist's job, or this lady's got a bus route, or, or, or whatever. I am just, I'm just busy. It just refuses. That's probably why Paul said, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, you know, while you're turning there, I'm going to read something about the church at Thessalonica. It says about them in 1 Thessalonians 1.8, it says, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Can I read that again? For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Boy, we got there and everybody had heard. This first century church needs to be the model we go back to. There's too many books being written today about the 21st century church. That's not, they aren't doing that good. We need to go back to the model of the church Christ left on earth and what they did from them sounded out everybody. And so Paul says to this church at Corinth, they were a very carnal church, very self-centered. They were living in the flesh, a lot of them. And he said in uh, verse number um, 34 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And so that was his message to this church. Wake up. Wake up. And uh, awake to righteousness. And sin not. Why? Some have not the knowledge of God. They haven't heard about God. And uh, Pastor uh, 
Shutt was talking to me Thursday night at church, and he said, boy, he says, I was talking to this guy uh, today, and uh, 55 years of age, pastor, and I was talking to him, I was going through the gospel with him, and he said, I have never heard that before in my life. 55, living in America. And Pastor Shutt was kind of shocked. He said, I, the guy said, I've never heard that explained to me before in my life. Thank you. And there's a lot of other people with that testimony. The church has fumbled the ball. And here's the solution. Awake to righteousness. All right? Don't get, feel guilty and leave it on. Just, just awake. Wake up and say, hey, wow, I need to get back with it. There used to be a time when I was soul conscious, and I need to get back to that stage in my life when I was soul conscious. You know, uh, America, you, you look at Nor New York, I mentioned uh, a couple steps from 10% to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 80. New York could be a changed place if every single believer in Jesus Christ in New York said, God, help me to reach another soul for thee. And do your best to disciple that person to the point where they would want to also reach somebody else. I don't know, that's when I got saved, man, that was just my consuming passion was to let others know. And so the Thessalonians, he didn't say the clergymen sounded out the word to everybody. He said, from you. Sounded out when he's writing to the church. And to the church, he doesn't say to the clergyman, he says to everybody in the church, awake to righteousness and sin not. When they had the great revival, again back in the book of Acts, this time in chapter number uh, 8, uh, when they had the great revival in the book of Acts, it started by persecution. And uh, it says in Acts chapter number 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at, uh, uh, at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Man, they were running for their life. This was one huge church. And God dropped a human bomb in the midst of them because they wouldn't obey the Great Commission. His name was Saul. And he was wreaking havoc on the church. And so everybody just started running for their life. But what did they do as they ran for their lives? It says in uh, verse number, uh, where is it? Acts 1, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, where were the apostles according to verse 1? Anybody know? Acts 8.1. Well, I read it about mm, a minute and 30 seconds ago. Where were they? Acts 8.1, the apostles. What's the last three words say in verse 1? Can anyone read the last three words in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1? <laughs> Except the apostles. Everybody was scattered. What did the scattered do? Now, who are the apostles? The, let's, let's call them the religious leaders of the church. The pastors, the missionaries. What did the ones that were scattered do in verse 4? Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went what? Everywhere preaching the word. So was it the people? Yes, in Acts. Was it the people in 1 Corinthians 15? Yes. Was it the people in 1 Thessalonians, or, or uh, whatever, yeah, 1 Thessalonians 1, 8? Yes. They went everywhere, and, and Paul said, when I got there, I didn't even have to speak this anymore. Everybody heard it. See, that is the model. That is the biblical model. Yes, those that are in the ministry should preach the gospel. Why? Because they're Christians. So should evangelists. So should missionaries. But somewhere we got this American culture thing that that's their business. That's what we hired them for. So I can go make money and they can go reach some souls. But that's not the biblical model. 
The biblical model is everybody. Everybody. And as a result of what happens in Acts 8 and verse 4, they're scattered, and it says they go throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria and uh, out of Jerusalem. They're scattered. Look what happens in chapter Acts, and, uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Then had the churches th rest throughout all where? Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. What was the result of them being scattered? What was the result of them preaching the gospel? The result was there ended up being church plants everywhere. That's the first time the word churches is ever used in the plural in the Bible. Acts 9.31. So they're running for their lives, but they're preaching Christ while they're running for their lives. And when you preach Christ in any town, any village, any city, eventually you're going to need a church for the edification of the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's how these churches got planted. Now in Revelation 5 and verse 9 and Revelation 7 and verse 9, it tells us that God has people in every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, every people. That's what it says. Believe it or not, that's what it says. And so if everybody all over the world who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior would reach somebody else, and let's, again, let's say they're just Baptists, in six steps using Christ's plan, the world would be reached. Um, and so I'm trying to enlist you to be soul conscious this morning. Every one of you, to be soul conscious, where you work, you know, maybe you can't go out on a visitation program, but where you work, in your neighborhood, you know, be friendly with your neighbors, try to work towards that time when you'll get to share the gospel with them, and then lead them to the Lord. Uh, we have a brand new neighbor behind me. And uh, I met her one day, and she was out, where, and, she's, and I said, oh, I, I live in that house there. And she says, oh, yeah. She says, I hear there's a pastor that lives around here. <laughs> and, and I say, yeah, I, I'm Pastor Cole. I, I live right there. She says, oh, well, you're Pastor Cole. Yeah, sure. And she says, okay, I just moved in here from Lakeview and so on. And, and uh, my boyfriend and I used to go to the Wesleyan Church down here in Little Valley, and, 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 and boy, I just, I just started working a conversation with her, and I look forward to talking to her more about the future, in the future, and then her daughter living with her, and so on, and just, it, it, just where you work, uh, in your neighborhood, uh, in your own family, I, I want to encourage you to leave the church today thinking, being soul conscious, because revivals have happened when people became soul conscious. And, and mathematically, mathematically, we can see the potential of what the gospel could do to the world on chart two or chart one, and what the gospel could do to the United States of America on chart number two. Even the worst state, Utah, number 50, 7% are evangelical. It's the worst state in the country, 7%. You know why? Mormons, okay? Well, let's say seven reached one, and now you had 14. Then 14, 28, and 28, 56. Then the next step, now again, a lot of Mormons are not, not gonna even talk to you, but I'm just saying it could be a better situation in Utah than it is. If everybody would say, God help me, fill me with the Spirit, Say, but I'm not good enough to be a soul owner. Boy, that lady in John chapter 4, read about her. She was a wreck. She'd been married five times and was living with a guy, and she met Jesus Christ. And then she goes back to the city of Samaria, starts telling all the men, and it says, many of the men in that town believed on Christ for the saying of the woman. She never took any soul winning courses or anything. And she was a mess, and she wasn't a very good testimony in her behavior. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, but God used her. Now, some of us 
And I'll just close with this here. Some of us remember the revival in this country that lasted from the 1950s to the 1980s. Some of us actually had a part being in that. Back in the 1920s, the Baptists became so disenchanted with their conferences. Uh, they began, they just got disgusted with the Southern Baptist Conference, the Northern Baptist Conference, the American Baptist Conference, that they all met right down here on Delaware Avenue in Buffalo and said, what can we do? Our conferences are a mess. Our colleges are a mess. You know, believe it or not, a guy like John R. Rice went to Baylor University, graduated from there. Man, boy, have they gone downhill. That's a Southern Baptist University. And they said, what should we do? And they decided, they, they met in the Delaware Avenue Baptist Church for six days, which is a big auditorium. I've been in it, it's huge, hundreds, 600 people or more. They finally rented out Kleinhans Music Hall, and the, the meeting went on for two weeks. Kleinhans was in existence at the time. Thousands and thousands of Baptists came to Buffalo. And some of the great Baptists, like T.T. T. Shields and others, said, we've got to come up with a list of the fundamentals of the faith. What are the fundamentals of the faith that we're not going to compromise on, we're not going to change on? And as a result of that meeting in Buffalo, a word was created in Christianity called fundamentalists. And they didn't know what to do, so they became separate, separatist Baptists. And they just said, we're, we're just going to leave the de denominations and go out on our own. And then that ended up coining the word independent. We are not going to be part of this conference. We're not going to be part of this headquarters. Uh, we're not going to be a, a, a part of uh, any, any kind of a hierarchy or anything. We're just going to be independent Baptist churches. And if you really study the New Testament, that's what the churches were. The churches were all solely independent of each other in the New Testament. They didn't belong to anything. They didn't belong to some big mother universal church. And so in 1950, for the first time, we began to have churches called independent Baptist churches. And God began to bless, and there was four decades of revival in the independent church, Baptist churches. In the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And some of us remember those days. I, I can remember those days. I can remember this church being involved in the tail end of that. I, can, I, have a, a, I have records of daily vacation Bible school uh, at the Farnham School Building where every night for five consecutive nights, the average attendance was 336 every single night. I remember seeing that. I remember being a part of that. The year before, it was 299, 299, 299, 299, on average, every single night of daily vacation Bible school. We saw that. I remember being in a meeting once where they set up five swimming pools, and I sat there and watched 200 people get baptized who had been led to Christ that day. It's unbelievable. There was a time when independent Baptist churches were the largest churches in 49 out of the 50 states. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Listen, because it applies to us today. I can remember those days where we, we couldn't build colleges fast enough. We couldn't build churches fast enough. We were sending out preachers. We were sending out missionaries and everything. And people just were, were by the thousands and thousands were being said, it was revival. It came on the tail end of the Welsh Revival, which started in 1901 and began to fizzle out in the 1950s. And, and revivals fizzle out. I understand that. And they have to be stoked up again. But here we are, and, and we look at the independent Baptist movement, and we say, well, was there any fruit that remained? There are 14,000 
independent Baptist churches in America today. 1950, there was zero. Today, there are 14,000 independent Baptist churches because of that revival. That is fruit that remains. There are 400 independent Baptist churches in Canada. And probably in any country where independent Baptist missionaries have gone, they have started independent Baptist churches. Now here's what concerns me, is the preachers that I hear criticizing the soul winning techniques of those people who saw revival, saw results, and have fruit that remains. Telling us the Roman road never works. Let me, still doesn't work. Let me tell you something. The Roman road is the word of God. And when you say the word of God doesn't work, I got problems with you. Because his word is quick and powerful and sharper than any, two, any two-edged sword. And those verses can still pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Still can Still can. There's books being read, written now by independent Baptist churches who have done, uh, pastors who have done nothing compared to those men about how their evangelistic techniques were no good. Shallow decisions. Listen, our Lord taught us that when you go out and share the gospel, some will fall by the wayside and Satan will devour it before it enters our heart. Our Lord taught us some will, will fall on shallow ground and it'll spring up for a little while, or stony ground, it's going to spring up for a little while, but then when they face affliction and persecution for their decision, they're going to wither away. Our Lord taught us some is going to be sown on ground where there are thorns and uh, when it begins to grow up, the thorns are going to choke the word, and it's going to become unfruitful. And those thorns include things like lusts, riches, cares of this world, where people are going to begin to grow, but then the cares of this world are going to choke them. But then our Lord said, some is going to fall upon good ground and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold, some 14,000 churches. And I'm getting tired of hearing people today, pastors today, who have done nothing criticizing the soul-winning techniques of those who in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s built the biggest churches in America. And in and, and, and America back then, you couldn't get elected as a dog catcher if you weren't a conservative. I'm getting a little tired of hearing it. And the Roman road still works today. And the gospel still works today. We just don't work it. We just don't work it. And I know, I know the country's changed. I know people are different. I understand that. But there's still a lot of gleanings left in this country and around the world. The Welsh revival fizzled out. The independent Baptist church kind of uh, right revival fizzled out. And people say soul winning doesn't work today and altar calls, you know, they don't work. You know who hates altar calls? The devil. The devil doesn't want somebody to take a sermon they just heard, go down, get on their knees, make a decision immediately about that, that, what they heard, and live it out. He'd rather have you say, I just think about it. And let me tell you, you, you do that, and by 2 o'clock this afternoon, you'll forget everything that you heard today. He's got enough distractions that by 2 o'clock, you'll have forgotten everything you heard today. And we need to get back to this. The Great Commission. Can you imagine if the Great Commission was obeyed in America? If the Great Commission was obeyed in the world and every believer, like the New Testament first century church model, said, 
I'm going to try to lead someone to Christ. If I die doing it, I'm going to try to lead someone to Christ personally. And then hopefully get them to the place where they'll lead someone to Christ. I'd like us to bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, help us. Lord, some of us that are older and have seen what you've done are concerned about some of these that are younger and are criticizing those. I know there was problems, Lord, with those, especially in the 80s when they got proud and started bragging about big churches and big colleges and big bus routes. And, and uh, like David of old, they started uh, taking the numbers and and uh, like Hezekiah showing all the things that they'd done and it just fell apart. But Lord, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We've got to look back in history and say, wow, they had it going on. But all the members of those churches said, I've got to try to lead someone to Christ. God help us. So as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and we're going to sing a song of invitation, but it's going to start playing right now. Maybe you just kind of think about this sermon and just maybe re-enlist. Maybe there was a time you used to aggressively look for souls and you had wonderful experiences. Yeah, you know, some of it didn't last. Jesus taught us that 2,000 years ago, that some would be on rocky ground. Some would be on shallow ground. Some would be among thorns. Jesus taught us that so we wouldn't get discouraged. But he said some would bear fruit. And this soul winning that's being criticized today resulted in the planting of 14,000 independent Baptist churches in America that are still open today. 70 years earlier, 70 years earlier from now, there were zero. Zero. Now there's 14,000. That's fruit that remains. Maybe those guys had something that we need. Would you come and pray today? God, help me. Help me to lead someone to Christ. Just Help me to, you know, maybe you're not going to get on a visitation program, but for all these years, if I go to the nursing home, if I went to the prison, if I do a funeral, if I have a church service, Sunday, I try to have the gospel. I try to preach the gospel. And even you that are here this morning, though our numbers are fewer this morning, maybe because of the summer, I don't know. But maybe you're here today and you're not saved. I would beg you right where you're sitting to open up your heart sincerely and where you're sitting, even in your own words, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I need you. I need to be born again. I need my sins washed away. I need my soul saved. And I can't do it no matter how hard I try. Would you please help me? Save me, Lord, this morning. And whether it's to individuals, and I'm not the world's greatest soul winner, but hundreds and hundreds of times since I gave my life to Christ 43 years ago at a missions conference, hundreds and hundreds of times on an individual basis I've shared the gospel with people or in church services and I've encouraged you to also what would happen in our own church here? Would you stand and we'll just close the service singing page 844. Grab your hymn book, turn to page 844 and sing this song like a prayer as you stand and join me. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I faithfully do my part to win that soul for Thee. Lord, there are souls that I should win, lost souls for whom You died. 
And may I never draw back or sin with fear or foolish pride. Lord, may I love as you have loved the souls of those I know. And grant me power from heaven above thy love for them to show. Thank you for attending this morning. Tonight, 6 o'clock, we have the Nathan Roberts family with us and all their children. They're going to be doing some music and preaching. Hope you'll be back 6 o'clock we start this evening. If you need to be saved, baptized, or something, want to talk to me about those things, stick around. I'm usually the last one to leave. You're dismissed. Have some fellowship with each other today. <laughs>